State University Foundation Professor in History and Director of Arizona State's Center on Race and Democracy, is that That's correct? Right. The founding director of, of that center, in fact, Dr. Matthew Whitaker, who's the 2014 Martin Luther King Jr. Justice Lecturer here for the Center on Race and Inequality. Dr. Whitaker, let, let's start off with a little bit about you. You have such an interesting backstory that tells, so has so many narratives on um, sexual orientation with your right. family, identity politics with the story right. of you and your father, um, growing up in right. Arizona, right. you know, uh, that the public enemy certainly was, was uh, mm -hmm. attacking a little bit. I doubt. And, and, and then getting to the point where you're one of the most renowned historians in the country at such an incredibly young age. But could you talk about a little of that backstory and some of the things that have helped you with, yeah. with, with your identity construction or yeah, constructed yeah. it in such a unique way? Yeah, without a doubt. Well, you know, I was raised in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, to a single mother because my parents divorced, divorced very early uh, in my life, and uh, didn't spend a lot of time with my father. In fact, in fact, my father was really wasn't around in my childhood. In fact, you didn't meet your father until much later. Is that correct? Uh, well, I didn't see him again until I was a teenager, mm -hmm. and then that was pretty brief. And then I saw him again when I was just before I got married. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was uh, it, it was a big separation. It was a pretty extended separation, uh, but. I had a large extended family mm -hmm. that uh, that helped raise me, and it was a very diverse family. But I didn't know there was a word that described who we were until I got to college, when people, you know, would say, "Oh, yeah, this is diverse. They're diverse people." You know, for me, um, you know, two women being in a relationship, two men being in a relationship, uh, it was not out of the norm. You know, right? Because your mother my, has a, a different my, sexual orientation. Exactly. My mother um, has had actually the partner she's with now. They've been together. Th almost 30 years mm -hmm. okay and then I have uncles who have married women from Chihuahua and Sinaloa and Mexico <laughs> I have Muslims in my family I have Christians in my family I have people from all over the globe uh, Japanese Americans in my family so to me it was just rather pedestrian it was just the way that it was there was nothing um, uh, marginal or mo nothing different about my environment when I got to college at Arizona State University however that's when I was a bit disturbed at how homogenous not only the university was at that particular time, but the mindset of most of the people at the university. The difference was, you know, it was like, whoa, even the most altruistic among them, it was something to be studied and fetishized, you know, right. something of that nature, the type of stuff that I grew up with. But it wasn't uh, foreign and it wasn't difficult for me. That is incredibly interesting personal history. Again, you're a prolific scholar. Tell me about Peace Be Still. Oh, Peace Be Still really is something I've been working on for years, and Clark Hines told me, and something that her advisors directly and indirectly told her, and that is every generation writes their own history. So you can build the history that you write on the, on the, on the backs of the greats who write the histories that they wrote when they were alive, but they saw the world and history through their particular lens, which is shaped and colored by their particular background and their circumstances. So you, when you move forward, you're going to have to write the history of African Americans through your lens. And so she told me that, and she also told me that the things that were in her book that uh, I wanted to see more of, she said, well, you write your own book. You can make sure you get it in there. You can frame it the way you want for a new generation, a different population, and uh, you will be the sort of next step in the historical family tree. I worked with her as she was finished writing her book with her co-author, um, 
authors. And I read chapters and make suggestions and things of that nature. And so this was a natural extension from that process. And the, only, the other reason why I wanted to do Peace Be Still is because, you know, when you speak a lot and you teach a lot and you travel a lot, you emphasize specific things that uh, you think that people need to know when you're talking about these, these subjects. This book is sort of my companion now because I can assign or reference or give or speak to a document that I have created so that there's no disjuncture between what I'm saying in my speeches and what I'm teaching in class and what people are reading. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a second way of educating people without confusing them with, with you know, different assertions, different analyses, and things of that nature. They can go get that on their own, mm -hmm. but when they're working with me, I want them to have something other than, than my words to draw upon when they're learning the history. Right. And of course, Peace Be Still runs from World War II right. all the way up to the election of Barack right. Obama to right. Tipperary America. And you're here with the King Justice Lecture, which is a part of Project Progress here at the University of Louisville, that looks at those last five years that our friend Peniel Joseph calls the historic, the, the heroic, the heroic period right. of, the, of the civil rights movement. So we're looking at 63 through 68, and every year examining 50 years later. You're talking today, specifically setting the stage mm -hmm. for, for this year at the University of Louisville and the Louisville community with 1964. Right. What are some of the things that you think are pivotal moments, pivotal ideas and movements and, and outcomes from 64 that, you know, fit into Project Progress, fit into Peace Be Still, fit into the growth and yeah. utilization of America. Well, one of the things I'm going to talk about in the lecture tonight, one of the things I talk about in the book is the importance of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, growing out of the long movement that began in 1954 and went up until 1964. Uh, the, this, the Civil Rights Act was huge, and of course, it grew out of the Selma March. Um, and lots of activism that preceded it. But the Civil Rights Act um, had two provisions that were so very important, you know, one of them uh, emphasizing the fact and reasserting the fact that discrimination in places of public accommodation was, was unconstitutional. Um, the Civil Rights Act had also had a provision that established the Equal Opportunity Commission, which could monitor discrimination in the workplace. There, there was also some language in it, just some, some, some general language about voting rights. We needed the, Civil, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to ensure that, and that happened the next year. So those two, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that was the culmination of about 100 years of struggle, um, led primarily by people of African descent that set the, the stage for progress and how we define progress during the next 50 years. Much of what you see after 1964 in terms of civil rights activism, appeals to the courts, um, marches and what have you invoked the Civil Rights Act of 1964, invoked the Voting Rights Act of, of 1965 in terms of voter fraud, uh, voter suppression, whether you can go here or there, um, the e uh, validating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did. It, it, was, it was sort of the crown jewel that particular year and the next year. The next 50 years, however, operated in some ways as a response to what that culmination is. And so the challenge for us now is to look back over the past 50 years and see what, what, what did it actually accomplish? What did it help us do? What did it help us accomplish? The positive aspects of those two things. But also, what were the limitations? There are lots of assumptions about what changing laws can do for you. But what we have found is that changing the laws don't necessarily change people's minds. This is an old saying that I'll say tonight that uh, cannons conquer, but they don't necessarily convert. You can change the laws, but that doesn't necessarily change people's mindset. So, and you see that in the history. And of course, people of African descent then had to adapt again. The question is, how did they adapt? How do we adapt? What do we do? What sort of um, uh, capital did we bring to bear to fight on our behalf? What did it do for us? What were the successes? And then, of course, what were the limitations and the failures? That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And that's a lot of what the book talks about. My book finishes by talking about Barack Obama's presidency and using him as something of a litmus test to determine how successful have we been. How are we doing? What, what, um, what are we looking at? What are we looking like? <laughs> By and large, um, we're not doing so well. And I say that, some people will, will, will shriek at that. They'll shriek at it and they'll say, look at you. 
you're a professor. Look at Professor Jones. You have Pan-African Studies departments now. And you have Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey and things of that nature. We are still by Yeah, our, I was talking to Oprah about that last night. Yeah, you know, she calls me all the time, too. We both got on speed dial. Right? Yeah. You know, these people are statistical outliers. And what studies are showing is that the majority of people of African descent, although we're doing better in some ways, are still either at the precipice of, 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 um, of struggle or are struggling in terms of being at or below the poverty line. Uh, we have six times less wealth than our white counterparts. There's one African American in the Senate and 17 in, 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 in the House. Uh, in 1964, uh, there were none, but we're talking 50 years later, the improvement is one in the Senate. And 17 in the House, we have an African-American president. But look what sort of racial antipathy his election unleashed. And what does that say about our actual financial well-being? Schools are more segregated than they were in 1968. Most black children, and Latinos, by the way, too, will go to school up until college, if they're fortunate to go to college, in environments where they're at a school where most of the people look like them. Okay in higher proportions than they were in 1968. So what does that mean? You know, th these, these are questions that we need to ask ourselves. So there has been progress, and the book talks about that, and I'll talk about that tonight. There's been progress, but that's shaped and molded by how you define what progress is. If we're talking about parity, which I think is what Dr. King was talking about, what X, Carmichael, Toure, all the people that we admire, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, we're talking about, we're nowhere near parity. Mm. Mm, that's and, and, and I think that's to, to the degree that there was a dream, that's what it was. It wasn't just about holding hands. It's about parity and equity, and we're nowhere near that. That's fascinating. Um, you know, on, on behalf of so many people, Dr. John Hill, who directs the, the Liberal Studies Program, uh, the Liberal yes. Studies Project, that the man. is greatly responsible uh, for, for setting this up, the Department of Pan-African Studies, Center on Race and Equality, Project Progress. We really thank you for taking time out, Dr. Matthew Whitaker.